This is Artwork Play Podcast, a family-friendly podcast about the meaning of life, which turns out to be, in the end, suffering. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, we have a report from the field to start us off today. Uh, uh, Ben's uh, our reporter, uh, who has the beat of um, the the mobile freemium app uh, scene. That's the beat that he covers. Uh, so uh, Ben reporting live. <laughs> um, so immediately after recording the podcast last week, I went on my phone. I, I like uh, phone-based apps, uh, phone-based games, and I know that that's like kind of gauche, but <laughs> uh, I do like it. it actually, friend of the pod, Sam Roberts, has a hot take on this where he says it's like, uh, a type of classism to prefer console yeah. or computer-based games, which yep. um, I don't know. I have like a thousand dollar phone, so I don't know if I buy into that, but uh, <laughs> I, I will, I will shield myself with that bit of rhetoric. Um, uh, so yeah, I downloaded the game, uh, uh, SimCity build it, which is put out by EA games. John, you're saying EA is like the, uh, you know, remarkably shitty. Well, they're like the corporate behemoth. They're like the they're pr- they're owned by Disney. Yeah, that's all you need to know. <laughs> right. Um, and so uh, became like deeply obsessed with it immediately and and like <laughs> literally blew the whole next day uh, building residences and built and uh, going up levels and that sort of thing. Uh, it feels like it has a lot of the same libertine commitments of the first one with, uh, well, you the, mean li- libertarian. <laughs> yeah, like, I do mean libertine I, commitments would be if it was about building orgy palaces. Yeah. Um, leisure suit, Which Larry, one? actually, I was just <laughs> playing a computer based, uh, uh, phone based leisure suit, Larry, uh, libertarian commitments, but, th- but th- with like, uh, very, um, uh pointed neoliberal edge the the thing about these good the, you're calling them freemium games the thing that's good about a freemium game is when you can feel yourself like a little bit handicapped because you don't ever do any in-app purchases like i i still ha- carry around the stigma against video games it's something deep in my lizard jock brain or something like that like i have like a self-loathing about committing fully four days to that game uh yeah. but I, so like my line in the sand is not to do in-app purchases and uh and you can't win without <laughs> in-app purchases do you, my all of, i had like a 14 percent popularity rating everybody was moving out everything was burning down and just couldn't <laughs> earn enough money to to build you really needed to buy your way to your city's success um, That's the secret of freemium games. Well, I don't know, because I love Mario Kart, and I feel like a lot mm-hmm. of care and attention goes into Mario Kart, and I-, I can be competitive. Like, I know that people that are higher than me on the leaderboards in Mario Kart are, they, it seems to me that they must be buying up all the carts and all the gliders, because there's no way to get a certain point standard if you don't have the right car or glider or character to get certain... Uh, like to get on the leaderboard, it's all about staying in a bonus combination mode. And you can only stay in those modes by through getting extensions with leveled up vehicles and leveled up characters. Uh, So people who are like earning 20 K when I'm doing it with just the free stuff I can get, I'm like at like 15 K or something like that. And we're talking points. So you, but I still feel competitive. I still end up like third, fourth or fifth, depending on the tier that I'm in. But yeah, w- Nintendo's uh, brand is a lot more generous mm-hmm. than uh, EA. EA. Right, EA is sort of known for its uh, behave manip- like manipulative behavioral uh, like design practices. <laughs> well, so and they it's very- really yeah, they're innovating in that field. <laughs> it's very manipulative, and so it's like neoliberal in the in the content of the game. Like mm-hmm. you have characters like um, like. 
when the this like figure dressed as a nurse comes to you when you want to like need to build a medical clinic in a residential area and you know you don't buy the most expensive one and she and the and the and the little avatar is like clearly pissed off at you and disappointed in you like <laughs> that you bought the cheaper one but then it's also <laughs> like that you have to like basically pay to win this is like uh so the we already kind of knew that there were these um libertine commitments of <laughs> of <laughs> will right uh but but <laughs> <laughs> but we see we see now that we, we, um the it, just this neoliberal escalation it's interesting this connects well to the subject of today's uh playthrough um bennett Foddy, because he talks precisely about why video games don't um, conjure the same kind of sacrifice commitment and kind of like religious gravity uh, of sports. And one of the things that he talks about is precisely the pay to win model. He also talks about grinding, which was something I hadn't heard about until I heard this <laughs> lecture. Um, maybe you can say a bit about grinding for people who don't know what it is. Yeah, Kat, you've done a lot of grinding in Pokemon. And Zelda most recently. Yeah, yeah, true. You have been grinding in Zelda Breath of the Wild. Mm -hmm. So explain Zelda Breath of the Wild grinding. Well, Zelda Breath of the Wild, you're, you are able in the 2017 release to the Zelda series. Um, it's an open world. I don't think it came. I think it came out in 2016. Just got. Oh, I mean, really? Oh. Might as well not. Don't give the nerds fodder. <laughs> Um, yeah, especially for the woman speaking. Um, <laughs> so in Zelda, you need to <laughs> prove your metal as a gamer here, Kat. You've already the cards are stacked against you. In uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild, it's an open world game, and you're you are able to after completing sort of the first uh, round of like tutorial uh, uh, zones, which just allows you to. Uh, figure out different, discover different mechanics, um, and then the plot, which is to defeat Ganon. You are able to just directly go and challenge Ganon after that, but um, you're encouraged uh, instead to grind your way to like a better, uh, to to have more hearts, have more abilities, have better armor, uh, because if you just go uh, and try attempt to defeat Ganon, you'll just get creamed. Um, what is have, like, grinding though? Yeah. Oh, I thought you said describe Breath of the Wild. He did. He did. Um, <laughs> I said describe grinding. Grinding. In Breath of the yeah, Wild. just uh, really monotonously uh, just trying to level up through uh, like attacking monster, low level monsters, um, gathering like experience points through that in order to um, in order to like slowly level up your experience. But it's, in Breath of the Wild, it's to do with money, not experience. Yes. So grinding is any activity in a game where it's like a tedious, repetitive yeah. activity to get incremental returns to eventually like mm -hmm. achieve. Well, wait a man explain it. I was <laughs> going man, like, just like just the long game <laughs> in my mind, but yes, so, exactly. So he Zelda says particularly, it is it is about money and and accumulating like certain things to then um, yeah to become stronger. But he, so Fadi thinks this lacks integrity, like grinding and, uh, and paying to win. And so he, like, he would, he would, he would directly connect, uh, this like in-game purchasing thing, this like, um, this turning this freemium game into like a major revenue stream where you pay real money for simoleons. Um, that is for him uh, diminishes the possibility of uh, of um, these uh, of, of of games to like reach the level of of sport, um, and it's precisely this kind of like um, get to a spot, quit, save, try again. If you don't succeed, try again from there. He says that diminishes the the uh, he diminishes precisely this effect, making games matter the same way sports matter. And be, there's a certain sort of like 
it's not not just the like commercial practices, but also just the uh, sort of non linearity of the medium that sort of takes it away. The sport decisions are so meaningful in sports because you can't take them back, but so often in a video game you can take back what you do. And Bennett Foddy's game that we'll be playing today, uh, getting over it with Bennett Foddy, is like it's him. It's him expressing this philosophy through video game design um, because the game uh, punishes failure very crushingly, <laughs> but the whole, that's the whole theme of the game. But there are save points, kind of. Mm, well, yeah, it's yeah, designed, can... it's true. It's designed in a way that, although it's not like you can start mm -hmm. from that point without consequence, you can you don't necessarily fall all the way back to the beginning. And it, when you quit the game, it saves your progress. Right. So Which how is this not grinding? How is the game itself not just an extended like, exercise in grinding? To me, grinding uh, most of the time has a lot to do with the intentionality of the game design, like what you're intended to do. Right. Very often, I like the idea of grinding quite a bit because it's uh, subversive of... It's like a it's a like agential act. Like the player is is taking agency to achieve the goals of the game the way they want to be achieved. Now that may be because of bad design, where the 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 designer isn't leaving interesting uh, options or choices for the player to take to achieve their goals, and so they have to resort to like slaughtering rats. <laughs> um, but. Uh, I like the idea of players like willingly doing it's and it is similar to this Bennett Foddy game players willingly doing these like repetitive monotonous experience uh, actions uh, in order to succeed by sort of by their own terms. But um, yeah, in that way, it's different for me because it's like this game has a very specific intentionality. Um, yeah, grinding so grinding so often has to do with games where there's like different vectors of progress and success. And um, in Bennett Foddy, in getting over it with Bennett Foddy, there's really only this one vector of success, which is climbing a mountain. Um, we so should say a bit about Bennett Foddy. Bennett Foddy is kind of like, is kind of dreamy in terms of his career. He's, yeah. he, he was a part of like, Cut Copy, which is a band whose mm -hmm. music I like. Okay, um, I've gone. I to forget school. about that. Yeah, yeah. that's super cool. <laughs> and he's like, uh, he's like a working philosopher, and he's also a game designer. Yeah, he went from he studied philosophy, then he was in this cool like electronic y indie ish band, um, and then he went on to be a game design professor, philosophy professor. Yeah, at NYU Game Lab. Is yeah, that it? I think so. Yeah, I think yeah. that's what it's called. It, so that like, he, the, what's the? How do you pronounce the like, one game? Quappy. Quop? Yeah, just Quop. Quop. That so uh, like, uh, Augie was playing that tonight, and Augie beat it. I nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, because Augie did exactly what he like. According to, I think John's definition of grinding is good because he's talking about not using using the game. Like, I, I think that you just use the game however to win, right? Yeah. Because yeah. it's not the same. You're not, you're not like, blood do doping or you're not, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, uh, you know, deflating the ball or something like that. It's like somebody <laughs> designed the game and you're playing the game. But Augie did the thing where you kind of do, like, a kneel scoot all the way to the end. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, right. But one, which I thought was great, like with the hurdle between his legs. So Quop, Quop is a, a game where you have to run like a, a 10 meter dash or something. Um, and, but you control the specific leg muscles with the Q, W, and O, and P keys of the keyboard. So it's just this really simple thing you have to do. But uh, it's the controls are so um infuriating that it's it becomes very i couldn't get anywhere i could get me like, like two or three meters and then i just the sat patience. down and was like i'm going to beat it <laughs> mm -hmm. good good one Og. so you can see the philosophy coming through in the, that early game yes which is also by bennett foddy i don't know if we mentioned yeah that's that. important that seems relevant <laughs> 
<laughs> um, we'll link it in the show notes because it's a mm-hmm. browser-based game. And a Flash, it's like he was working in the Flash medium, <laughs> which was sort of where a lot of the people who uh, became part of the first wave of like, in not the first wave, but the first com- wave of commercial indie developers, I guess. Uh, a lot of those people came out of de- designing for f- designing Flash games. Um, and Quop seems like a seminal Flash game. Uh, it's very, he's, it's, it's so minimal and simple, but um, uh, it's, I, I feel like I played it. I don't know when he released it, but I get, I remember playing it as a teenager with no knowledge of like, mm-hmm. it's just a thing that was on the internet. And then he, he designed another game um, that was, uh similar mechanics but with uh rock climbing too so mm. well, rock climbing by like mashing buttons on your keyboard we're talking about i don't know if we said but we're talking about getting over it today and getting over it is like as you say it's this infuriating game this repetitive game um but it also has like mass appeal like it's one of these games that seems to capture imaginations even outside of like a nerdy video game culture. Like I would have thought this would have been like a very niche game, but by no stretch of the imagination is it, it was topping steam and sales for some time. And not niche in the strange world of like Twitch streaming that we live in Mm -hmm. now where games become a performance and some games can be designed to be better performances. This game, because it's really ridiculous looking in it, you play a man sitting in a cauldron with a giant hammer and you have to climb a mountain with that hammer. Um, And without getting out of the cauldron, you don't, you stay in the cauldron the entire time. He's so muscular that he can drag himself along with the hammer, but it's also produces these like expressions of rage and frustration because it's so punishing. Um, of, and in the play, it's difficult yeah. to the, the frustration. The yeah. the so players. that's fun to watch and it sort of generates performance. So it's sort of designed, it has a very canny design, I guess you would say. So, and this is kind of like leading to our reading of the, the since there, like in the mechanic of the game, there is this, um, it, the mechanic of the game expresses this kind of like philosophical uh uh element it's a meditation on challenge and difficulty i think as well as like um the those aspects of the quality of human suffering i guess you you would say like sort of uh there's um um sort of an ongoing monologue throughout the game which you will hear later in the podcast he'll be a fourth voice on our podcast um and that monologue is about just like the sort of difficulty and challenges you face day to day and what it's like to fail at those things. That's an excellent way of putting it. And, 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 it, and thematically it's consistent because that precisely because of the frustration that you're talking about precisely because it, you are confronted with not only cresting this mountain assembled out of like a brick, a brack of assets, but like also you have to like, let the rage and frustration pass through you as you attempt to uh, master this game. And so that for that reason, we um, thought it would be interesting to uh, look at um, pessimistic philosophy in relationship to uh, uh, this game as a sort of uh, springboard for uh, doing our playthrough. And uh, we chose Schopenhauer because he's a hilarious fucking figure. Um, and, uh, so we're going to do, uh, we're going to, um, uh, reboot some of his philosophy. So I, I'm going to start, um, this is from, uh, studies in pessimism. Uh, this is the chapter, uh, called on the sufferings of the world. Um, y- you'll really get the sense that this guy was like very, uh, dour and miserable but hilariously in life he was like uh he was like very upbeat and he seemed to like revel in pessimism uh, <laughs> um he it, his 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 understanding of pessimism leads to a sort of moral responsibility toward the sufferings of other but uh famous famously he was like completely intolerant of other people like a good portion of his earnings 
um, after a certain point in his life um, uh, were garnished because he shoved an old lady down the stairs because she was talking too loudly. (laughs) And then, um, and it's interesting because I read in uh, the Schopenhauer Cure, which is kind of like a fiction, nonfiction mashup um, where he was compared interest in an interesting way to Nietzsche who advocates for the self and for the, uh, and for, um, you know, the, the amelioration of the individual. And then Nietzsche in real life was a very kind and gentle person. Uh, although he did, um, he, he, he did play in interesting ways in Nazism. So this from Schopenhauer's, uh, studies in pessimism from the chapter on the sufferings of the world. Unless suffering is the direct and immediate object of life, our existence must entirely uh, fail of its aim. (laughs) You'll see why this plays well with uh, with Fadi's game. It is absurd to look upon the enormous amount of pain that abounds everywhere in the world and originates in needs and necessities inseparable from life itself and serving no purpose at all and the result of mere chance. Each separate misfortune as it comes seems no doubt to be something exceptional. But misfortune in general is the rule. I know of no greater absurdity than that propounded by most systems of philosophy in declaring evil to be negative in its character. Evil is just what is positive. It makes its own existence felt. Leibniz, in particular, concerned to defend this absurdity, and he seeks to strengthen his position by using a palpable and paltry sophism. It is the good which is negative, in other words. Happiness and satisfaction always imply some desires fulfilled, some state of pain brought to an end. This explains the fact that we generally find pleasure to be not nearly so pleasant as we expected, and pain very much more painful. The pleasure in this world, it has been said, outweighs the pain. Or at any rate, there is an even balance between the two. If the reader wishes to see shortly whether this statement is true, let him compare the respective feelings of two animals, one of which is engaged in eating the other. (laughs) (laughs) The best consolation in misfortune or affliction of any kind will be the thought of other people who are in a still worse plight than yourself. And this is a form of consolation open to everyone. But what an awful fate this means for mankind as a whole. We are like lambs in a field, disporting themselves under the eye of the butcher, who chooses out first one and then another for his prey. So it is that in our good days we are all unconscious of the evil fate may have presently in store for us. Sickness, poverty, mutilation, loss of sight or reason. That's such an interesting list of bad things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just a short. <laughs> Just to name a few. <laughs> No little part of the torment of existence lies in this, that time is continually pressing upon us, never letting us take a breath, but always coming after us like a taskmaster with a whip. If at any moment time stays his hand, it is only when we are delivered of when we are delivered over to the misery of boredom. (laughs) But misfortune has its uses, for as our bodily frame would burst asunder if the pressure of the atmosphere was removed. So, if the lives of men were relieved of all need, hardship, and adversity, if everything they took in hand were successful, they would be so swollen with arrogance that, though they might not burst, they would present the spectacle of unbridled folly. Nay, they would go mad. (laughs) And I may say further that a certain amount of care or pain or trouble is necessary for every man at all times. A ship without ballast is unstable and will not go straight. I feel like that is incredibly relevant to the game we're going to be playing, but let's keep reading. (laughs) Certain it is that work, worry, labor, and trouble form the lot of almost all men their whole life long. But not all men. (laughs) (laughs) But if all wishes were fulfilled as soon as they arose, how would men occupy their lives? What would they do with their time if the world were a paradise of luxury and ease, a land flowing with milk and honey, where every jack of chain does Jill at once and without any difficulty? Men would either die of boredom or hang themselves, or there would be wars, massacres, and murders, so that in the end mankind would inflict more suffering on itself than it has now to accept at the hands of nature. 
He's going to get himself canceled with that heteronormative bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you meant, I think that even, I think that he's right. That like, like Jeff Bezos was miserable every day. as just <laughs> as much as the rest of us, I'm sure. <laughs> in early youth, as we contemplate our coming life, we are like children in a theater before the curtain is raised, sitting there in high spirits and eagerly waiting for the play to begin. It is a blessing that we do not know what is really going to happen. Could we foresee it? There are times when children might seem like innocent prisoners, condemned not to death, but to life, and as yet all unconscious of what their sentence means. Nevertheless, every man desires to reach old age. In other words, a state of life of which it may be said, it is bad today, it will be worse tomorrow, and so on, till the worst of all. (laughs) (laughs) The one thing, so on the subject of SimCity Mobile Edition uh, and this game and what you said, uh, Bennett Foddy talked about about um, uh, the inability of games to approach sports because of things like um, uh, uh, pay to win systems. Um, it makes reminds me of and in the context of this game, especially where it revels in in uh, failure and in in sort of like. <clears throat> um, we, it's similar to a quality of what are called roguelike games, where they have. Uh, a roguelike game is a game uh, where you uh, are trying to make it through all these levels, but there's permadeath. So once you die, um, you you die for good. So it's sort of similar to this game, although you don't die, you just go back to the bottom of the mountain. But that risk and that pain and that failure mm-hmm. creating, uh, providing a character to the whole experience, which I think somebody like um, this like Schopenhauer is saying that like with that, that's the ballast that keeps the the boat straight is uh, uh, the sorrow that you feel. And so I, I think um, Benefati thinks so as well. We're in this, in, in getting over it, you risk of losing it all at any moment makes your successes all more sweeter. Uh, sort of cheesy. Well, I don't know because it's like the, the I mean, if it turns the trick, it's not cheesy. Like, I mean, a lot of the things that we construe to be cheesy are so because they've become cliched, but it doesn't make them any less impactful. It doesn't make us any less sentimental about them, even if we wouldn't like to admit it. Um, the it, It's interesting, too, because Schopenhauer builds to this kind of like moral point around pessimism, whereby like accepting that life is suffering, we should see and meet in others the fact of their suffering. A lot of his philosophy is derived from like um, uh, Hindu traditions and Buddhist traditions. And so that you'll get this sense that like, if we can just kind of like get over the myth of optimism, uh, then life would go on a a great deal better. (laughs) His whole thing is like, uh, we desire and we enact our will to sate that desire, but, you know, immediately... Uh, desire reproduces itself. We never actually get to happy. It, it, it's it's the happy is just not suffering. Hmm. And was was he an atheist as well? Uh, I don't know. I should think so. He he makes a lot of fun of Judaism and all Jewish religions, in which by that he includes Christianity. Hmm. Uh, he thinks that, like, for instance, he has this whole treatise on why suicide should. If if anything, suicide is a mistake, but it's definitely not a sin. And he's like, <laughs> I mean, I get why you'd want to kill yourself. <laughs> it's sort of his whole brand. <laughs> um, would you guys like to start our playthrough of getting over it with Bennett Foddy? Yes. Fuck yeah. Yes. Um, I'll be playing today. Cat's going to be playing today. Ben, I'm going to mute you now. This is where you can put the transition music. Unmute me. Uh, n- no, I'm going to mute you. So that we capture. So that I capture the Benefati uh, sound. Wait, let's do a clap now so that we can see it. So unmute me again. Uh, oh, you're not muted yeah, yet. Yeah, muted yet. Okay. okay. So before you turn on the ben, turn me off. Let's clap yeah. again. You count us in, and then mute me. Okay. Three, two, one.
Uh, okay, we're, we're in Benefati now. And what we see is a man. There, <laughs> you have a character in the middle of the screen that is a naked man inside of a cauldron holding a hammer. He's next to a tree, and there's uh, the foreground is a little bit of water. Uh, it's, it's very much like a two. It looks like a two D platformer, uh, and you can see sort of a, a parallax background. You're looking at it from the side, like like, like a, the beginning of Mario. Yeah, like a side, side scroller. scroller. It's interesting. The uh, apparently this the character himself, and then. Most of the assets are just like free assets that you can get. He describes it as asset core, which I find like to be a very awesome aesthetic title for this game. Mm -hmm. I remember, John, when you first started showing me some of the shit you were doing and uh, bringing out some of these assets, that uh, this it was like the very captivating part about Unity. Like, th like if you look at the wind in the tree, there there is something, even though it's like very synthetic, there's something nonetheless kind of nice about that, that gentle breeze. And I guess there's some sound <laughs> going. I, there's, I, there's supposed to be sound because there's, there's subtitles yeah, some sound rolling. Oh, you okay. It. Um, it's being recorded. The, but I mean, like the sound of, of but I, yeah, I wouldn't be able to hear it. Yeah, the wind, no there's nice wind noises. Um, uh, all of the, the prefab asset ethos is a, it's a design, that goes throughout the game. All the music is, um, uh, what do you call what do you call it when a copyright lapses? Public oh, domain. Public domain. Yeah, all the music is public domain. <laughs> um, the yeah, the assets are all free. The character as well, and then so we'll start approaching the mountain soon. You'll see it's just made of all these free three uh, D objects that he bought online. So uh, your or that he got for free. <laughs> your um. Your mouse controls the the placement of the tip of his axe, hammer. Uh, hammer. Um, and so there's no clicking. There's, there's very little control. Woo, there I go. And so you sort of and shuffle <laughs> yourself along by like dragging the hammer along the ground. And the guy is very strong. Yeah. So if you like grab onto the branch of a tree, like Kat is trying Thanks to right now, you can actually launch yourself up in the air. And you're the only, I'm pretty good at this part. The first part <laughs> seems like impossibly hard. Oh yeah, you got it, you got it, you got it. You got it. I always get stuck on this part. There we go. Nice. Oh, yeah. So the so the first thing you do in the game is you have to leap over a tree. Using oh your fuck! <laughs> okay, I just but it's uh, just so difficult um, that it. I remember the first time I tried to do it, it took me like twenty five minutes. Uh, but you really do the thing. Oh no! The sort of the sort of like so. Cat has started climbing the. Uh, I'm gonna get over the and, tree. and we're getting uh, we're getting a, a clip by Bennett Foddy here talking in the background about. So he's kind of describing a little bit like the the background of the game, its connection to sexy hiking, um, and and kind of some of his uh, thinking and making the game. I feel um, like John, if you if you if your um, game has like aesthetic allegiances, your game design has uh, aesthetic allegiances to Ian Chang. I feel like there are certainly echoes with this asset core. Yeah, big time. Oh, yeah. Uh, both as like a, it's like just a, it's funny because it's commenting on the like material conditions of the working, um, like the working method that you just find yourself in if you're working in Unity, especially, or like, or just like being a, being a, uh, a video game artist or video game designer generally, uh, in, who is indie. And um, yeah, you end up working with found assets all the time. So it sort of becomes yeah, this okay. like, come on, come on. Oh, so you can I pogo, eh? This. You can pogo I'm, jump? Yeah, I'm not great at pogoing. Let it's, me try. It takes a lot of try. coordination. I'm shit at it too. Sorry, John, what were you saying? Um, <laughs> that, yeah, it's like the found assets thing is sort of, I think it's sort of a, Sort of a, he's he's very much a game designer's game designer and um, nerd. That the uh, 
<clears throat> like using the found asset um, aesthetic is very much doing something that other video game designers are going to appreciate because it's also like it represents the material conditions that they're working into. This is immediately a new another challenge that I'm facing here. Because you sort of get worse as like or like I'm not saying you specifically, but I find <laughs> as well like sometimes I hit these periods where I just get worse at playing the game if I get too frustrated. Yeah, and it becomes. Um, there's like certain techniques that like do better in other places. And, and sometimes you could oh, like right here, I'm definitely. Hard. So right now, you the first step up the mountain oh, after you on. climb over the tree is you have to vault yourself from this rock onto this paddle, like a canoe that's paddle that's just sticking out of. But it's sticking the canoe probably out and it's totally static. Like there's totally no physics, erect. no hinge in the, in the. <laughs> May I try this? Yes, part? you may try. Okay, yeah. well, we're, we're tag teaming. Okay. okay. Um, In a certain way, sexy hiking. Yeah, you're doing the pogo. It, it does a good surrealist thing. I mean, apart from, as we'll see as we get up oh, the mountain. Oh, wow. It there he goes. The assets um, Your task is simply to oh, become no! more and more improbable. That was, that and was really quite impressive. It in, starts with just rocks, and yeah. then after a while, you're like... And there's an ore which kind of corresponds to the to the water, and there's a the house, and maybe theme. you know it's a it's a hurricane or something like that. There's like some things that have some oh, suggestiveness in terms of narrative. Oh, Jonathan just made it quite. Oh, 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 oh. The Devil's Chimney. Oh wow, here you go. This isn't the Devil's Chimney. Oh, not yet. No. This, this is another technique, so you can actually sort of like lift yourself up with your hand. Rod and you poke at it, exploring the limits of your reach. <laughs> but I can't do that very well. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. And then it's like the game works uh, by like making you so frustrated that you just you try to do something really fast and then you mess up. And the whole time he's kind of delivering these every pixel these like consoling little aphorisms. Yes, very aphoristic. Sexy hiking are unyielding. And that makes the game unique. And again, the beautiful tree in the background. But I'm not sure Jazzo are in the wrong way. Oh, oh no. The frustration is just yeah, like, essential quite, to the act of oh, yeah. And it's authentic to the process okay, of building a game about it. I think you got to play yeah. with that. A funny thing happened. There's a point at which I'd have I got in this game where it's like I didn't really have to get any further. And it would you <sighs> Um you got the idea. Oh wow! Okay, here you but go. But there is a win state which I haven't I seen. Like yes. Well, I've, wa I've just watched. There's this the speed it. runner oh, that um, beat it in three so minutes, and then deletes their game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's this great clip on YouTube where a speed runner, yeah, beats it. I think in less than three minutes. I think in under thirty seconds. Damn. Um, oh, Jonathan. Oh, and uh, and then just immediately deletes the game. Like by night. <laughs> No, on purpose. Like just like as soon as they beat it, you just it, like command Q exits and then just deletes the game immediately. Just because I think they're so frustrated with it. Yeah. And I love that. And yeah, they've also like funny. you can see because they're uninstalling it on Steam, you can see, oh good job. Oh, is that ah! oh, wow. Yeah, that's because they're uninstalling it on Steam, you can see that they've already won all the accomplish or the achievements rather um, <laughs> on Steam. So it's like clear that they've just spent I think you can actually see then how many hours they've spent playing. And it's like, you know, a, an unreasonable amount. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, sorry. yeah. Quite I think you could like feel there's a certain, it makes or <laughs> another reference to Schopenhauer and his ins being inspired by uh, um, like okay. Eastern, <gasps> but, uh, <sighs> being inspired by, by Buddhism. Um, there's sort of a meditative quality to the game. There's sort of like this sort of embrace of just the formal qualities of it and, and trying to divorce yourself from like the moral. Oh, oh, like nice. oh, just, oh, hey, hey, hey. Yeah, but it. you didn't go, don't make, no, no, go the other way. Make, make use of this. So make part of the way of that the levels are structured, are structured is that when you make a mistake, you can fall almost all the way back to the beginning, which John just did. Apparently, there is a way to. Back to the ore that he was helping me with. Right. This thing that we call failure. Apparently, you can die by going in the water off the left of the screen. Really? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Did you sink? <laughs> but that's at the very, very first part of the game. So it's just like if you go the wrong way, you just die immediately and respawn. <laughs> 
I've never. Oh, there's that's the one dynamic object. There's a cup. There's a couple. There's a couple, but yeah, it messes you up. Also, I think the man is in a cauldron with hot water or some. Yeah, hot there's. Water I think it's a sweat. sweat. <laughs> you, Back to the beginning. Yeah. And so my I'll cat might have just order. as well been playing this whole time and like. Uh, the way that she was playing at the beginning when she couldn't get up to the or because now I'm just at the exact same place we were. And so you wonder, like, what's the point? Why was I doing this the whole time? But the point is the experience. The lesson is in the journey. It's just a sand mandala. In <laughs> yeah, exactly. Every, every time you fall, you're just erasing the mandala. Um, <laughs> you made a very authentic sound. Yeah. The, the grunts and stuff are all very good. Uh, yeah, when you fall, it plays like sad jazz music. <laughs> um, <laughs> great. Crying here. Something that he, that he talks about in a playthrough of this is that the game has no <laughs> systems. And that oh, yeah. Because there's no physics or gravity. Just that would be the only system, really. You that you are interacting with. Gra there, there's a gravity system that you're interacting with. Oh, there is. Oh, right, because you fall down. I guess I was just thinking of the objects that don't move. Yeah, yeah. There. I mean, there's very little. Just one for the player. One of the things I was thinking about. There's this sort of like when we were talking about grinding earlier. There's this sort of like. Um, uh, there's this sort of like snobbery in game design in like content versus systems so if you, like when you're building a video game world, there's a game games that often require grinding something like a pokemon or elder scrolls or even breath of the wild although breath of the wild is better at it but they are con they have a lot of content in them and they're sort of known as like um uh content uh you, the a derogatory term for them is like content de delivery machines <laughs> where the the point of the game a game like elder scrolls uh, or like, which is a massively a mass, not a massively multiplayer, sorry, but a massively op open world, uh, game where you level up and become a better, better wizard or whatever. Um, that game is just there to serve you like story points basically, or to serve you like text dialogue options with characters. Um, whereas a systems based game, uh, which would be something like a simulation, like the sim, like the Sims or SimCity, as well as you could have maybe a, a game w like, uh, the spy it's all the sort of espionage games like um, uh, Splinter Cell or Metal Gear Solid, maybe to a slightly lesser extent, or uh, those sorts of games where the world is this dynamic system. And in order to achieve your goals, you have to interact with the system. So, for example, maybe like uh, setting um, the setting a tree on fire to distract somebody there where you're interacting with systems and not just like interacting with content. Right. Um, yeah. Is this the hell chimney? This is the this is the devil's chimney. So that's the context, and I feel like that goes to him talking about being a, a game designer's gamer, where he's actually making that as a sort of like coy formal commentary that is also to do with. Uh, um, he's basically making like the cheapest game he can make in some ways, and that's sort of part of the art of it, where there's not, the systems uh, take time to design, and are sort of like, they they are expensive in a way, whereas like prefab content is, prefab, uh, yeah, content is sort of the cheapest thing you can, cheapest way you can make a game. So he's almost like saying like, look, I can make a game in the cheapest way possible, but it's still really awesome and, and popular and artsy as well. Yeah, it really is, it does, it really does, um, have that it's, it's functioning on a lot of different levels I was thinking of when you first showed me this game and Susie was over that night and this is somebody who doesn't play video games probably has no interest in playing video games whatsoever and she was drawn into it and she made a reference to it later and it's interesting to hear that oh, kind of, you know what I mean that nice. even it, st it stuck with her what did yeah. she or did she did she describe it or, or? It was, we were doing something uh, um, 
working on uh, some part of the play and then she made an analogy between something that was happening in the play with... <laughs> <laughs> it's like that game John was showing us. That's awesome. Like, it's like what? a man in a cauldron. <laughs> it's like being a man stuck in a pot. I think you got to pogo that chimney. How? No, There's you gotta technique. like. There's I've gotten up it before, but I. It's. This is the point of the game when it's, it's like, like once I get over it, and then I kept going for a while, and then I got sent all the way back to start, and I've never had the courage to do this part again. It's like you have to pogo it, but then also yeah. do this. Yeah. yeah, but you don't have enough room a lot of the time to... I think you got to use the lights as cleats. No, I don't think that... I don't... Oh, yeah, you can. Shit, you're right. Just watch oh. the playthrough. <laughs> Just watch the playthrough, yeah. Just watch him doing the playthrough, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's funny. The, does he talk in that playthrough? Does he talk about the idea of like being good at? Oh yes, right. He says how his only criteria for like how hard it was yeah. was whether or not he could do it, which is a really hilarious thing. In once, yeah, whether he could achieve it <laughs> once, yeah. which is again, it's like sort of the opposite of what you're supposed to do in game design. So. Another way how he's trying to sort of be like a bit of a Marcel Duchamp or something, someone who's like ch challenging the f like these sort of baseline assum formal assumptions of the medium. Yeah, and I think pushing the medium ahead as a result of that, like he was running a course um, at NYU where they had to come up with a project every week, which mm -hmm. I think like that breaks the video game design out of a kind of. Um, the tendency towards uh, industry that you see in a lot of uh, university and college programs and takes mm -hmm. it back to like working with the form and trying to make the medium do different things. Yeah, it's his his game design program seems like it's seems like it's coming from a very artsy place. Yeah, a bunch of the works we, that we saw this oh, year yeah. at the Maze Festival in Berlin. Um, the, Were like, people the, who are coming out of his class. Mm -hmm. oh, I hadn't and specifically that. out of the one, like one game a week design class because it really <laughs> challenges people to make, um, you know, things that are unusual because that's sort of just the constraints of work, like creating something in a week. It produces unusual things. And the core... The essential like quality to to, or sorry, the the like the the necessary that's that's the right way of saying the necessary thing to becoming a good des game designer is to design a lot of games, mm -hmm. uh, and like that's true of everything to a certain extent. But there's something in the way that um, game design requires like iterative, like an iterative process that you have to get good at the idea of iteration and like there's something it seems. So he's sort of becoming this uh, guru of it. And what what's the equivalent in like art or writing when like everyone took one person's class? I, the new the, the new Hegelians all studying with Hegel <laughs> in, uh, in uh, right. Berlin or whatever. And then like <laughs> founding their own school of law. It's like it's like the Velvet Underground, man. <laughs> Kat, do you remember any of the games that amaze? Um, like, I don't remember their names and no. the people who made them, but I remember, um, the you... one, my favorite, well, I should, I, just cause I remember this one, one, which was created, that was the only mobile game that had placed, um, that was a series of like mini games had been developed out of, uh, those were developed within, th those mini games were all, were, things that she had done in Bennett's body's class she'd mentioned, but then she kind of packaged them all together into a um, biographical game. And we can and put it in the show notes once I search for it, because I'm sure it'll show up. I'm sure I've written it down somewhere because I liked it, but... Nice. Mm -hmm. That was like just a neat way of, yeah, taking the things that she'd learned in school. And, oh, Then sometimes I sort down. of fail and it's like, I, I just want to... Hey, wanna, don't, don't... Well, I just want to knock myself you're off slipping. the edge. You're you know, slipping. I just want to... Suicide. <laughs> Edging. It's not a sin. <laughs> Edging is not a sin. Um, I'm not going to get any further than this, Jimmy. Give it to Kat. Yeah, 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 please. Great. That mouse was gotten, very sweaty. Yeah. Oh, shit. That was sweat. Don't blame your tools. It's not the mouse's <laughs> fault. 
So wait, did you? Oh. Did you pogo <clears throat> your way over here? Yes, yeah, sort of, you guys sort of have to pogo your way. Kat is trying to pogo her way onto a rusty beam that's hanging off of rocks. To get up the devil's chimney. To get up the Oh, oh yeah. no. <laughs> get just to the devil's chimney, not even up the devil's Yeah, chimney. you're so far making negative progress. <laughs> that's definitely a pogo. Um, so this is a, this is also a good metaphor for having an art career, I think. So you fail all the time. <laughs> yeah, like the false optimism that yeah. is required yeah. to keep Never making things. The sort of stupid repetition of like just like trying again and again and again, like even though you're just always at the bottom of the mountain. <laughs> and be like, you're where? always at the top of the bottom of the mountain. <laughs> yeah. Where? Where'd you get up here? How Pogo. going? Yeah. You gotta launch yourself off this thing. <gasps> <Yeah>. <gasps> Okay. <laughs> yeah, now it's playing the best song. Going down the road feeling bad. <laughs> I really only have one technique, and okay, that's the, like, it. blind hope. This, this, this part's the funnest when you're going really fast. Yeah, and you're like, oh, I could do this. Oh, I could do this. Oh, fuck. You sort of just have to, fuck. hilariously, you just have to keep swinging the hammer in the room. Yeah, the you right can get into rhythm. a real flow state. Like, you can really get into a thing where it's just like, yep, it's working, it's working. Oh, it's no. Working. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. Uh, oh. And it's funny because you're like defeating yourself when you're losing. You are truly. Your, I think this your mouse is really sweaty. <laughs> 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 Sorry, it's a two-player game where I'm the goal of the game is to get the most as sweaty as possible for the next person who plays. Um. The concept of the the flow state is one that I think is pretty relevant to this game, and um, the flow flow in games is sort of can be represented as this graph, uh, where one axis is um, the difficulty of the game, and the other axis is the uh, player's skill level, and you want both of those things to well you you want both of those things to increase at a at a, a relative rate so that hmm. the game gets harder as the player gets more skilled at it. Oh, and oh another God. sort of like <laughs> snobby game design opinion is that like good games are sort of like games that just are pure expressions of that, the power curve as it's called. Or wait, the player power curve it's called. Oh, I forget yeah. who called it that, but we'll have to I'll quote it. And um, the um, this game is a really, one of those sort of like it another more evidence of it being the game designer's game it's a sort of pure expression of that player power curve where the or not really a pure expression because the actually yeah interesting to think about that context because the game's difficulty right. sort of stays flat it's always really yeah. hard it's just your experience that in increases I think that's I'm back at the or again <laughs> if anyone's wondering and I'm suffering <laughs> I'm really. No <laughs> rainbow. Oh come on, come on! I can't. I... What were you going to say, Ben? I think that this is one of the things that, um, like thinking about what, because talking about video games. I mean, it's easy to um, term any kind of creative content art, and to do that shorthand. Um, one is really tempted to think of this as a more arty game. That, uh, and I think part of that is like the elusiveness of trying to zero in on the various <sighs> qualities that make this uh, um, so compelling and so engaging. Um, I think another thing about it, though, is precisely this uh, internal struggle that you're talking about, where you, you're confronted with, uh, you know, the different qualities of the game. And it does, <laughs> you, it causes <laughs> these feelings to pass in and out of you. In a way that is maybe different than, like, maybe it's, like, something that's very specific to video games. Like, maybe it, the, 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 this, like, I can't think of an analog for what would have the effect of this video game mechanism in, say, literature or cinema or anything like that. Yeah, I think that this, in terms of... It's, like, as, an asinine, like, uh, sort of taxonomy of trying to, like, qualify video games as art, but... For the most part, but for this game, it works. It it's I think it is pretty like useful to talk about because uh, 
the game, the the content of the game is so engaged with the formal qualities of what a video game is, and it seems to be it's just very much a video game about video games. Yeah. So. I th I think just that sort of like, um, yeah. I mean, that 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 is that's just something which usually like you find in pieces that people consider as being art is that sort of level of formal engagement. But I and I think also there's something about this game that gives me a feeling of the sublime in some way. <laughs> <laughs> it has a transcendental quality to it. <laughs> there's the. There's the uh, that art and labor. They read that essay. I can't remember the name of the of the person who wrote it, but one of the interesting takeaways from it was, uh, well, for me anyway, was how Marcel Duchamp in introduced this idea of punchline art. Um, and I don't. I think like even though I very much appreciate um, not the Stanley Parable. What's the other one? You always have to remind me of this. Uh, Dear Esther? No. Beginner's Guide? Beginner's Guide. Beginner's yeah. Guide, in a certain sense, becomes, apart from being um, kind of uh, an expository work, it also has, like, uh, uh, like it, 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 I mean by that, that it gives a lot away through, like, open exposition instead of, like, th through mechanic and metaphor, as this uh, game does. Uh, and it yeah. does have a bit. Of, it, it often has these little punchlines. This game doesn't feel like it has that in the same way. Which... Yeah, it's more. Uh, it's more experiential. Um, yeah. Yeah. You're really sweating up your bucket, cat. Yeah, I'm impressed. <laughs> there's anything left. No, it's I... just your sweat. Or Ben's Ben Ben earlier made when yeah, you said that said... it was full of water. Ben made the. Uh, assertion that he thinks it's actually sweat it's so hot. the question is whether you're sweating or whether your the cauldron is full of water well uh actually uh mr foddy says that it's full of sweat so okay, okay. that well, well did he just did he just say that like jokingly or did he actually mean it that's a good question <laughs> It's in, uh, yeah, I like thinking of this in terms of um, the Davy Readin games like Stanley Parable yeah. or Beginner's Guide, uh, because those are engaging very much with game mechanics as like a formal medium and communicative tool and what those tools mean for the message that they communicate. Um, but much more so. Yes, on the level. I did my first pogo. That nice. was good. Fuck, and I fell. And much more so on the level of content, I think, than si systems. Even though he says this doesn't have systems, it's pretty much y just you interacting with this one simple system of gravity with a with a tool, a hammer, or and that <gasps> it's in that Dang. one, like it's in that one um, experience that it expresses all the content. Besides the voiceovers and um, music. And uh, like visuals, but like the me the mechanic itself just communicates a lot in this game. Yeah, and I mean I, but I do think especially the little um, the little bits of where where his his voice is piped in, I find those very satisfying as well. I, I, and I I also found find the text very rich. And, and it always comes at the most irritating moments. I can actually feel myself being resistant <laughs> to whatever he's saying. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, I what, don't look at the subtitles. And I in what ignore. other textual medium could you, like, does the author get to sort of craft how you feel in such? I mean, of course that happens in, it just feels very poignant here, I guess. <laughs> it, I do uh -oh. think the frustration thing is played up with this and it's a bit of a marketing tool and I'm a bit dubious about it. But on the other hand, it does feel very different from... Uh, oh. Uh, you know, oh, fa fails. failing in other games. I don't know quite why. So, well, so often a game games have save points, like we were discussing, that you can like go back to after when you don't when you do something you don't want to do. Um, you can undo to that point. But a lot of games recently have been uh, including some sort of like permadeath, like I was saying, uh, in order to make the experiences. 
It's More interesting real. that that's where the <laughs> crux of meaning is in this game. And yeah, maybe because it has to do with like r realism or, or naturalism, maybe. maybe. Some, yeah. Mm. Mm, um, I fell down again. I mm, fuck, I fell down further. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to a podcast where Fadi was like doing his like Desert Island games. And a lot of the games that he chose to take onto his Desert Island were like older arcade games. Um, and games for, I think, like an early Commodore system, maybe. Wow. Um, but I, I may have that wrong. Um, but uh, a lot of them involve the development of a sort of skill in relationship <gasps> to the... To <gasps> Sorry, keep talking. No, no, that's all right. <laughs> a lot of them um, uh, centered around uh, developing a skill uh, in connection to the action of the game. He, he, he said, for instance, that Gran Turismo wouldn't make his list because it becomes too technical, too much about memorization. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and I think maybe that's part of the sensation of being invested in the failure because it, it is, it, there's something skill testing about it like sport. It's, like yeah. I, it's not surprising to find that he thinks about making video games, um, uh, getting from video games the same kind of emotion that are associated with sport um oh, that was it's so it's interesting yeah because you think of those older games as being they're sort of they're low on content you know they're this is they're formally i think very similar to this game in a lot of ways because the consequences are quite a bit higher in or, or the consequences of your actions are pretty high because like in mario if you die uh if you lose all your lives then you uh yeah. Nice. Uh, you have to go back to the yeah. beginning. Yeah. Look at this. No, it's a very Look sexy this show move. Off. I'm not showing off. Oh, that was John. I thought it was Cat. <laughs> oh no! I I I, uh, I don't know if you noticed. I threw up my hands. And I did it. Well, I can't see your screen. Oh, All I can, you can see is burly man over here. Burly man asset number one. Well, do you think could we because it's a public domain at, or do you, could we access this asset somehow and start selling like illegal merchandise of it? You yes. mean the asset of him in a pot? Yeah, and start like yes. just Oh selling. yeah, by the way, plugs. We're selling uh we're selling getting over but with Bennett Foddy t shirts. <laughs> <laughs> you can domain. find that on spec.work. Uh they come in all sizes. <laughs> It says, listen to the podcast underneath. <laughs> so, ha, so back to your, your the, the, talking about the kind of like sniff attitude uh, um, in, uh, com when comparing systems to content. What is all this Death Stranding hype? Uh, the, like I saw a meme where it shows somebody playing Death Stranding and then in the next uh, kind of like uh, square there's the person is no longer playing it they're eating popcorn and watching it how come that like that would seem to suggest to me it being a bit of a tool for that those kind of like cinematic elements yeah but people are like shitting themselves for this thing to come out well the yeah so the epitome of content is the cut steep cutscene like cutscene is pure content there's no let's maybe i'm talking i'm thinking of like a, a spectrum between content and interaction maybe those are two poles of of an axis um and the cutscene is pure content zero interaction um and uh and like um in a lot of games that's criticized as being like a lazy storytelling, you're using the wrong medium, all that other stuff. I think, um, Kojima, I don't know very much about Metal Gear Solid. Kojima is the guy, right? Yeah. He's the, the designer of it. Um, he but is, he's, he's, he's credited considered with, to be he's credited with author. having developed a lot of, like he, like he does have these cinematic qualities. He, like I follow him on Twitter now. And he's like, he talks a lot about his investment in cinema and, and he's just kind of very open about that. But like people who talk about Metal Gear Solid will talk about how like he invented um, uh, like the kind of like AR effect in military games that like he invented that kind of idiom, like different and different uh, systems for like the uh, heads of display sort of thing that th you have those sorts in of things. Games. Yeah. yeah. And so he also has influences in, I guess, in these other systemic ways. 
but, um, I, but, but I cut yeah. you off. You were saying something. I think I was just getting ending whatever I was saying before. Um, he he still yeah designs these games that have uh, systems that you can play with. Sort of like I was saying, he's right. he's working in the. Um, He's working in this sort of like espionage genre, uh, which is or stealth game genre, I guess is the mm-hmm. better way of putting it. And stealth games, um, they they the 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 first big one of uh, I'm sure there's ones before this. I don't know enough about video games, but uh, the the first really like genre defining moment was the game Thief from the late '90s. And in Thief, among other things, you had you emitted sound when you moved around, which wasn't really a thing that had been done in right. games before. I think yeah. really, and so you could alert the guards by like being too loud, so you had to be quieter because they're always listening to you. Um, you could, but then like I was saying before, you can interact with the systems, other systems exist in that game like light existed um you could shoot arrows arrows at torches to put them out and then it would be darker and so guards couldn't really see you and so that's uh kojima is working in a similar um mode where it's like uh working building systems and the player has to interact with the systems to solve their goals so i think because there is that level probably that that's another aspect to why the sort of like uh cinematic uh qualities of the metal gear solid games are like loved by people is because he's also obvious he's not doing it because it's he's weak on systems he's doing it because he also is sort of like Maybe partly working in that genre of of video game cutscene. That's part of the formal qualities of the medium he's working with. But I'm not an expert at this. We should get an expert on to talk about this. <laughs> Wink. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's that's basic. We've we've done our time. Uh, do you guys have any plugs? Um, you can still rent space at the Brandscape, uh, but it's going fast. So if you're listening to this. <laughs> Call soon. Mm-hmm. Um, go to the brandscape dot club. Yeah, there's a big space that's opened up in the back. That's actually pretty good. It's pretty good. But going yeah. fast. Um, anything else? Uh, uh, um, if you're if you live in Regina, you can come to our. Um, we're having our. We're starting a new. Uh, Program program called at, the Artcade. Yeah, it's okay. like a it's a Thursday night. Um, uh, just like what it sounds like, uh, an arcade of of digital media art, or and and what it also can be is like sort of a drop in, like work on uh, digital art together. Uh, find out what sort of things we use to make digital art. Uh, just ask questions or show show us stuff you're working on. That it's in awesome. Regina, Sis- Regina, Saskatchewan. At the Mackenzie Art Gallery. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where is the two of us both work. Kind yeah. Of important. Cool. Yeah, um, which we haven't discussed yet, which is there. Weird. Is there a link for your thing? Uh, not No, currently. it's just, it's secret now. So it's, this is the secret way you're finding out about it. Yeah. Whoa. You heard well, it here we first. will, we can post the link to the the page that has our photos on it. Noticeably not Ben's photo, but your body is like quite... <laughs> looming in we the used the, the we used a headshot or like that we had all just taken together but then just like cut out <laughs> our two pictures individually <laughs> and nice. there's just That's this cool. massive t-shirt in the back <laughs> i don't feel just weird sh- about it <laughs> a shadow looming over us. <laughs> uh, uh, but yes we can we can post that which will assumedly at one point help hold the information to uh future events that we will plug when that happens too Okay, bye. Oh, yeah. Good one. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to stop recording now.